So, good afternoon, guys. Uh, thank you for coming. Hope you had a chance to grab your uh, burger or at least get some salad. Um, <laughs> but I think that's not the main part of the, of the conference. Um, my name is Johannes Evers. I'm a retired IT consultant. I'm driving a little bit the average age of this uh, conference upwards. And uh, yeah, there are some others with some gray hair. I know. Um, but still, so as I was retiring, uh, I'm look, looking for a nice project to do. And always like comics and graphic novels. And I said, OK, why not do something by myself? Yeah, I, I didn't know what I went into because yeah, I said that's 120 pages and six uh, images per page, so well, we do something like 800 pages would be nice. But then going forward, I really understood what that means. So I'm not completely new to uh, 3D graphics. Started about, yeah, I would say, end of the last century with uh, a program called Poffray, still. Uh, existing, so you could do it. In, in, in uh, the top one was uh, 2001, I think, and uh, you could do volumetrics. You could do quite a lot of stuff, but it was very clumsy, and yeah, render time were very, very long, and you get some 800 by 600 pixels and stuff like that. So. Um, Later, I went over looking something more handable, something that is easier to use, and I came up with a combination of view and Blender because I liked uh, landscape, outdoor scenes, clouds, water. As you can see, there is a certain obsession with boats and, and ships and wooden ships from the 18th century but also uh, fishing boats, uh, Grand Bank schooner, and stuff like that. And I think around, yeah, with, with Blender 2.5 and up, I really went to full Blender for my projects, because cycles and all you could do with Blender then, more memory and so on, didn't, uh, I didn't need the view part of that. View was more the frame where I collected uh, objects that I had uh, modeled with Blender, and you did all the shading and the clouds and all the stuff. Now, that's, that's a little bit my background, what I like to do, landscapes, ships, water, stuff like that. So that was also where I looked for a story, because in the beginning, we would like to talk a little bit about the artistic consideration of the uh, comic doing comic making, then we will look more at the Blender stuff, assets, especially characters. I've been working with uh, Manuel Bastioni lab add-on for my characters, and I want to tell a little bit about the experience I made, how it works, what, what uh, are the, the kings, and so on. Uh, next thing, scenes and shots. Um, how to put all the assets together into a scene, and then we come to some off-blender stuff, post-processing, because I wanted to get a painterly look into my comics, and that is still not really possible with, with how I do it in, in Blender. So uh, I had to use another program that I want shortly uh, introduce. And then back to Blender for page assembly and layout because I was looking for something to do the comic pages and I really didn't find any, any good program or let me say a program that I could uh, buy for a decent amount of money. So back to Blender for do the, the uh, assembly. Yeah, if we got a little bit more time, then we can talk about publishing and resources. And I'm not yet at that stage, unfortunately. I thought I would be further. Um, I'm now working on that one and a half year, but it really takes more and more time than you think. Okay, how does it start? Um, first, I needed a story. And I'm more, you know, a visual artist, not a, a story writer, so I was looking for something and uh, came up with an old story by Rudyard Kipling, the author also of the Jungle Book. 
uh, that's called Captain's Courageous. Uh, it was done in 1897. And I knew also the movie they made in 1837, one of the first with Spencer Tracy, late Spencer Tracy, a very good actor. Uh, later I find out, found out in the, in the research that there's also a TV uh, uh, show from 1977, then they did another one, a movie in 1996, and even somebody made a science fiction story out of it. But now I think uh, another 20 years later, it's, it's up to get a comic out of it. And fortunately, um, all the rights on, of the stuff are already free, so there won't be a big problem. Um, it, it's a way to, to, to find a story if you're not a writer and if you don't have a friend who is a writer or whatever and nobody to work with, you look at some older books and maybe try to transform the story into a different time. So what I did was transform that story into a science fiction environment so the, the guys are not on the Grand Banks with their schooners, but they have some kind of shipping fishing planes on the ice moon of Europa in the uh, Jupiter uh, system. Um, story is about, yes, yeah, it's sad, spoiled little boy, rich boy learns what life is really like after he falls overboard in the middle of the ocean and is pick it, picked up by a fisherman. So I had to find a way, um, how the hell do you do fall out of a spaceship? Yeah, by accident, and I picked up, and so on. So I came up with a story. I've uh, published the first chapter of that thing, um, uh, and I think you can find it with with uh, on your YouTube um, and have a look at that. But it's more about how execute it. So first thing was, what the hell looks uh, Europe, uh, Europa, like? in maybe 200 years. Uh, what I didn't want was uh, anti-gravity hover cycles, because I don't believe in that, but I could assume that we have some cheap fusion reactors. Yeah, so energy might be cheap. You also need that for the spaceships, probably. Otherwise, with chemical spaceships, you can't do that. And I also assumed, okay, if they have that energy and uh, uh, Europa is a, is a very important part of the Jupiter system, then they might do some terraforming, at least try to get a thin atmosphere on the ice moon. So we, I would need maybe an eighth of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. I don't know if that's realistic, but you can assume. I mean, it's at least easier to assume than anti-gravity. Um, Europa is roughly the same size we our Earth's moon, and it has also uh, same gravity. That means a sixth of the Earth's gravity. That again means you can build, yeah, kind of planes that don't need that much power to lift. And I said, okay, what kind of propulsion system would you need? and thought, okay, it, it's probably more mechanical, physical drone thing, yeah, because that's very effective when you have a low, an atmosphere. And for, for forward propulsion, you might have some additional um, propellers. You could have moving wings or stuff like that as they are now in, in, in trial. But okay, I thought that looks good and it could be workable. So that's my, my fishing ship. That's from the Grand Bank school schooner to this kind of thing. So they also need some fishing boats. So these, this red one is a kind of open uh, helicopter with four um, propellers. And they, they can be uh, put in the hangar that there's room for about six, I've measured that, about six uh, fishing boats. And so that somehow roughly uh, fits to the story of Kipling. And of course you need uh, icy place, some, some ice um, um, mountains and a lot of clouds. Um, so 
what, what I did was also experiment a lot with clouds and did a lot of experiments with, with ice. The big advantage of ice is that you don't have any trees. <laughs> so um, you don't have to render trees, you don't have to render a jungle. would be a nice challenge, but that's much easier as a landscape. Yeah, so I'm lucky for, with that. Good. The other thing, of course, is you need some spaceships. So what does a spaceship look like in uh, the next 200 years? Do we want to have this Griebel Star Destroyer look from space war? No. <laughs> no, we don't. So I was looking for something that also might be a little bit more realistic. And... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a design a little bit like the 2001 Odyssey in space. You have a lot of containers. You have a central structure where you can put everything. And what we also have is kind of, I mean, you, you, you have to give it a little bit of specific uh, touch. So what we have there is a kind of, let me see, does it work? Yeah, here are these shields. Shields in front, but also shields on the back. Why on the back? I mean, normally when you accelerate, uh, you have the, the dust or debris that you might hit in the front. But if you decelerate, then you turn the spaceship around. So you need a sh uh, also shield in the back. Um, then we have some, some tanks here, some... Uh, I don't know, fusion engines, fusion reactor. Fusion reactor has some heat spreaders because there's a lot of excess heat that you might get rid of. Um, so I try to be a little bit realistic with, with the spaceship design. I mean, however you can be there. And then this is a habitat that would also, as we don't have any artificial gravity, we have to do it with uh, centrifugal forces. So this is re rotating stuff. You can find it in a lot of movies. And I want to keep uh, consistent to that. The other, of course, is space station by itself, a very big structure, because if you think a lot of people are living there, also space stations have to be big. And, uh, you know, you see here a docking port for several uh, spaceships, transporters. One is here and it's unloaded. It's probably not visible with the details. It's unloading here through this port. So to make that economic, uh, secret weapon, of course, is uh, skin modifier and, and wireframe modifier and a lot of planes, so the, the objects here by itself are quite simple, but there's just a lot of uh, wireframe modifiers to get that nice look, same also there. Good, so that is uh, some, some consideration, and I think that's also a fun part to think about what would the, the world look like in the Jupiter system in 200 years, how do people uh, travel, how do they live, what do they look like, and so on. Um, and, and the next step, of course, is to decide how do you want to render that? What should your, your images uh, look like? And when, when I see people doing comic art, it's, it's a lot of time manga and toon shaders and stuff like that. But uh, actually, it's not what I want to go because I didn't think it would fit to the subject. So you can have, uh, you know, stylized characters big eyes here. Um, you can have these stylized characters also very well painted with crayon or whatever, so you get something like that. Or you might have, uh, oh, where is it? Classic Möbius style here from Edena, uh, very flat uh, shading, but very realistic forms, also quite nice. But I was looking more for something like that, a realistic rendition with more, more realistic forms. But I also wanted to have the painterly look, we come to that later, uh, what, what tool to use for that. But anyway, somehow all the comics are in here between, there's mostly a, a, a mixture. So if you look at 
uh, Elita that they also made to the movie. movie. Uh, big eyes, but rather realistic rendition in, in black and white. So there, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, but I had to find my own style. So um, I did a lot of experiments, of course, in the beginning, should I go with a kind of toon shader? So on the left side, the two on the left are done with the cycles toon shader. You can, I think, get interesting results with that. It's just a mixture of a glossy toon shader with a, with a diffuse toon shader, but uh, it was not really what I wanted to go. You can mix it with with bump or without bump map. Um, but what I was looking for is uh, the classic cycles PBR. Yeah, and then in a post processing, give it a little bit more painterly, painterly touch. Maybe I mean today with the EV. Um, you have this nice shader to RGB or shader to color node that when you put that through a through a, a color ramp you get very very good I think tunish uh, shading uh, so there are more possibilities with the cycles shader but this this node is not available as far as I know in the in the cycles world but should be should be really uh, also be done in, in cycles. Okay, so but at the beginning, I think it's a lot of considerations. What do you want to do? How sh should it look like? And so on. And then, of course, the big question is, I can't draw. I'm not good at rigging. I'm not good at modeling people and all that stuff. So how can I proceed with uh, a comic that has at least 100 different characters in it and, and you know, it's not like two or three characters in, in a short animation. It has a real large number of characters. And that's when, uh, uh, yeah, we come to the assets. Okay, as I said before, assets. Um, I come from project management, so I, I try to go in there with a very structured approach understand what assets I need, that is uh, uh, space, planets, moons, and we have talked about the uh, spaceships in a modular design, so if you have a basic design, of course, you can do different variations on that. And space stations, and of course, space stations hovering over a moon, so you need also some clouds on the moon. And that has to look quite nice. Still not happy with that, but there is still time. Then the vehicles in on the ice moon, the, the, there's a big cruise ship. You know, the boy has to fall from something. However, I manage it. So there is this uh, big, big uh, cruise ship. What is it? Oh, sorry. Uh, I cut my, my finger. So it's a little bit difficult to finds a knob, so that's a big cruise ship, that is a fishing sh ship trawler, and that is a, a small one for the shippers. Here the ice moon, a lot of uh, experiments, of course, with landscape, and then interiors, also a lot of interiors, doors, and this is uh, interior from the uh, cruise ship. Um, of course, it doesn't look like this alien uh, scientific corridor stuff with a lot of tubes. Uh, you, you don't want to have that on a, on a cruise ship. But, of course, you have a lot of, lot of assets. So, for me, it was very important to come up with a, with a structure for the assets. Just want to briefly show you through it. So, first thing, of course, it's, it's, it's a directory and I've Doing, I'm doing uh, backups to a cloud with a synchronization program, not yet Blender Cloud, but it's another cloud provider, but uh, do after work every day, there is some, some uh, synchronization with my cloud storage so that I don't lose anything. Then the highest level, there's a story. I got the, the Kipling book from a Gutenberg project really took it apart, put it into a spreadsheet, uh, looked at all the, the speakers, the people, 
that uh, done any actions or so, so it really separated the whole chapter, unfortunately it's not that long, yeah, and, and, and modified the, the raw text into a kind of spreadsheet form. Um, second area is assets, that are all the different assets I need to build my scenes. Then uh, the characters that we will talk a little bit more about, the vehicles uh, on the ice moon, spaceships, interiors, uh, only a part of here are mentioned, but I really try to keep the, the assets separate from the scenes. Um, actually learned a little bit about that from the, from the Blender Cloud. Um, I mean, before I had only worked on, on, on single, single pictures, single images, but uh, it's very good if you have some ideas from the animation world how to structure your stuff. Scene files here with, uh, depending on the, on the story, interior, exterior scene, whatever, and then the pages that come out of that because the last step is building my uh, comic book, so I need these page assembly stuff to support. So it's linking, rendering, and of course some other stuff like scripts, and, and a lot. I, I try to keep all the tests I'm doing separate from the scene, though that I do not clutter uh, the scene stuff. Yeah, okay. and. In all of these different assets, there's normally a file for blends, there's a file of pictures, test renders, and some specific textures, uh, texture maps I have, or here there are some, some uh, shared texture maps. So character maps are mostly here, and other stuff is then here, and, and keep that in that order. I mean, you can discuss it. Uh, it's sometimes done differently with different projects, but that's helped. And uh, you can do it, of course, whatever you like, but I would uh, urge you to, in a bigger project, really start from the beginning to uh, organize all your stuff that you don't lose it and find it back and <laughs> get your scenes done. Good. So that is an assembly of some characters that I needed for the first scene. There are much more for the whole uh, comic, and you can understand that I was looking for an easy way to create characters, because it's not just uh, superheroes in spandex. You need some wardrobes, that means sh shoes, standard shoes, high heels, what have you, claws, tops, pants, suits, hair, still not happy with that hair stuff. Um, but, okay, then the bodies, they have different age, different gender, different size, different colors, different heads, and so on. And first thing I did was uh, looking at the Make, Make Human uh, program that can export to Blender. And I took the, the Make Human output um, and then tried to do rigging with a Blender rig. And that was really hard. I mean, I learned a lot of stuff about that, but at the end I gave up, especially rigging, rigging uh, the expressions, rigging the face. Uh, was too hard for me and drove me crazy than doing some weight painting on fingers and, and stuff like that. Probably you have to be really be born for that or have a good hand or don't know. Yeah, yeah, small parts, and it didn't. So, but I did my experiments with Blend Rig, and I think for animators, it's probably very good. Um, but for me, I don't need all the fancy features that, that are in there. And luckily, what happened was that uh, Manuel Bastioni, guy, probably Italy, uh, came up with an add-on roughly at the time when I was experimenting uh, with this character stuff, and, and that actually did all I wanted to have. It's well integrated into Blender and helps me to create all the characters I need. Doesn't do the, the, the clauses, we come to that later, but uh, 
there's a lot of stuff that I need. So anybody has used this Manuel Bastioni add-on here? Yeah, at least some. Okay. So the uh, first thing is it gives you a lot of choices when you to, to start with. There are uh, base meshes for Caucasian, Asian, man, female, African. There are some uh, anime females that have you know, larger eyes, uh, realistic anime that have a different shader. And of course, you can have your elves and dwarves, you know, all these pointy ear special characters if you are in fantasy. But what I was interested in is really the base, base stuff, Caucasian, Asian, male, female, so six different base meshes that uh, very well represent uh, basic, yeah, the basic features of these, these uh, people. Um, you, you also can select between uh, three types of rigs. One is a very simple uh, FK, forward kinematic rig. Then there is uh, inverse kinematic rig that might be better for animation. And then here it's also uh, bones, bendy bones that simulate um, muscle movement. So my characters mostly wear clauses, so the muscle movement is not so important. I also played around with the IK and FK rig and actually went with the FK because for my posing in the, on the, on the uh, characters in the scenes, it was, was easier to handle. And as you will see later, I'm, I'm doing that with uh, pose slip, most of the, uh, the posing. So it was uh, the six different base meshes plus uh, uh, forward kinematics rig. So when you have made the basic selection, what do you want? Um, Caucasian male or Asian female or whatever, then he gives you a, a set of uh, uh, base morphs. That means you can have a very athletic figure here or you can have a thin figure uh, out of a selection of, of basic uh, attributes that, that, that fit quite well. So, I mean, if you have your list from the comic, what kind of figures do you have? What do you want to realize? Um, that's a starting point. Then you might look for something else that is not, you want to have normally a different face than the, the standard face. Yeah, one thing I tried in the beginning was uh, look at my favorite, favorite actors and actresses get some photos from, uh, uh, from the internet, uh, superimpose them this to the uh, standard uh, face mesh, and then mess around with all the parameters. That works to a certain extent, but you normally don't get nice photos from the internet because they should have the same camera position that you have in Blender, and you also don't get nice pictures from the side and so on. But you can, if you want to, you can also take photos from your family or whatever and start to get in some variations. Um, the whole process uh, takes a little bit of training because you have a lot of parameter sets, and each parameter set has a lot of parameters. So at the end, you might, uh, <laughs> easier to, to model the thing yourself, but as I'm not a good modeler, I'm going with the parameter sets. Um, you, you start normally with uh, head, basic head form, lengthy or round or whatsoever. Then you go to a face. Then you have rough, the rough face. Uh, then you position your mouse. If, if you have a reference photo, then you position your nose, then you position your eyes, and then you already have, I would say, quite, quite a good resemblance to the, to the reference photo. So, and then you start um, 
working with all the nitty gritty details. It's, it's good to start with the bigger parts and then go to the smaller parts. So first the head by itself and then go to the position of the ears and position of the mouth, mouth and, and jaws and so on. Here are the parameters for the, for the nose. It's probably the most difficult because you can, oops, where was I? No. Sorry, but uh, so um, because you see, the, you can change everything: uh, the length of the nose, uh, wides, the 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 uh, wings, angels, and so on. So you have to somehow do it five to ten times to get a feeling about what all these parameters are doing. Uh, Luckily, you can store all the stuff in a JSON file, export it, and then uh, export also intermediate results and uh, load it back and start again and do something like that um, if, you, if you have made some, some mistakes. Okay, next thing, uh, clause. Manuel Bastioni doesn't come with clause. Yeah, so you have to do your own claws. Uh, in the beginning, I started with a copy of the skin, but that doesn't fit from the from the mesh. So uh, I, that later, I did did my own claws mesh. Uh, starting point, of course, is a kind of overall. Uh, on the on the ship, they're also wearing overalls, but you also want to have uh, pants and, and uh, shirts and whatever. But you can start with that and then cut cut it off to create a shirt or... Um, normally I use uh, several materials and put the materials and on, on areas of the mesh, keep it separate. I don't do an, an overall uh, material painting. Um, it's just the way I do. Important then, so that it looks realistic, is wrinkles, wrinkles. I got a book about wrinkles, so bending wrinkles, compression wrinkles, stretching wrinkles, find out what wrinkles really look like. Uh, and then I I'm, I'm just use uh, texture paint to create a kind of wrinkle map. It's not, um, it's not sculpted, it's just uh, uh, painted and then with a displace modifier put on the skin. You could also sculpt it, but I want to reuse the, the claws for other uh, models and other, other characters, so it's easier to uh, then uh, deform the, the, the base mesh and then put the uh, wrinkle map on top for the displacement, then sculpt all the stuff. But it's not so different as a process. Maybe one point also, if you want to do it, is for instance, if you have these types of, of uh, bags here, you can have, uh, what is it called, a lattice deform modifier. You know, just uh, shrink wrap a plane on the, on the claws and then use, uh, or before use, uh, I think it's a lattice deform modifier to put the bag on the plane and then shrink wrap the whole thing on the, on the mesh here, and that gives gives a good way to to create uh, something that's not just flat. So in the end, looks like that, um, all with all the residual wrinkles. But I was also looking for some dynamic wrinkled stuff. Yeah, maybe that is not so common. So what I looked at was tension map. Yeah. Okay, um, tension map is, uh, yeah, in that case, a vertex color plane that is generated by the deformation of, of the mesh. Yeah, so this is a non-deformed mesh. Then you have some armatures and you deform the mesh. And of course, part of the mesh are compressed and other parts of the mesh are stretched. And uh, the old Blender renderer had a mapping uh, option 
called stress that did that automatically. Um, so you could do with the Blender render, you can do that quite easily. But with the cycles and probably other renderer, you have to run kind of script all when you when you change the armatures. And luckily, I found a script uh, in uh, Blender Artists from uh, Scottish Cyclops and Scott Winkleman and uh, Pyro Evil, Jean Francois Goland, that had worked on that stuff, provided a uh, uh, Python script to do that. I had to do some, some updates on the script because it didn't work with linked objects or linked groups. And uh, you also need um, a kind of smoothing function on the, on the raw uh, tension map to get it, get it a nicer, nicer uh, form. But it, it, it's working quite well in, in, in Blender. And when the new API is there, it should also be transformable to Blender 2.8 if you want to have something. So what do you do with it? It just generates um, using some, some uh, uh, texture, wrinkle maps, so to say, generates these displacements. Yeah? It just takes a, the, um, the color from the um, vertex, from the vertex colors, um, maybe do some gamma correction because sometimes it's very, very low, yeah, very low intensity, split the red, green, blue parts, put it through a color ramp, and then you have here some texture you want to apply. So if there is a compression, you have a, a, a red blob, and where the red blob is, you multiply that with a, with a map. And then if you want to have uh, uh, stretches, you do the same with a kind of stretch map, put everything together, and put it here into the displacement of the material. And then you get that effect. So how do you use it on a, on a character? It's a character walking here. And these uh, uh, vertex colors are created by the script. So the green are compression, red one are stretching. I find out that stretching doesn't work so well. It doesn't look very realistic, but the compression is quite nice. So if you want to do some dynamic wrinkles with compression, you can uh, use this map. And then you need a specific yeah, for the claws, every clause is different kind of map, but they are similar. So you would have here some, some compression at the arms, uh, here, here, also here at uh, the pants. They are the areas where, where the compression happens. And uh, so I don't know if that is good visible, but, but then you have the, these... Uh, dynamic wrinkles in that area where you need them. Yeah, here, here. It's not the best picture for that, but that's what I had. Um, so if you need some dynamic compression on clauses and you don't want to go for full clause simulation, that might be an interesting way to go. Good. Next one, hair. Um, yeah. I'll <laughs> I use these... Uh, this technique that is in the CG Cookie uh, Blender training, where you uh, have uh, um, uh, nah, where you model the hair by by uh, passes by, you know what I mean, splines, splines, stuff like that, yeah, and then you can have. Uh, uh, splines for uh, uh, beveling and and then you get these, these kind of hairs. Have a look at that. Interesting hair shader here. Try to get a somewhat realistic look on that. So that is a combination of a velvet shader, a glossy shader, <laughs> and diffuse shader. Um, the principled hair shader doesn't work for that so well. It's more for thin, thin films. But uh, here you can get, with a velvet shader, you get some nice 
nice uh, effects and you know I had to do a lot of hair. Yeah, so for the overall uh, thing is MBL, so Ma uh, Manuel Bastoni base character, uh, then with all the parameters you get a story character, you can store it in JSON and maybe start with a different rig or different whatever and reload the JSON, that's very useful. And then there is a process called finalization um, when a kind of exportable rig, rig is, is uh, exportable character is created. That has also expression, shape keys for expressions. Um, in parallel, you do the uh, clauses. The Bastioni lab has a function called proxy fitting that also changes the clause mesh uh, to something that fits to the character, the, the, the story character. It's not working so so very well, so I tend to do it by hand, uh, rescaling the clause to, to the character. But in principle, it's doing quite well, but it do some, it's doing some distortion on the vertices. Yeah, but it's very, in principle, a very nice function. So everything else is then put in a group. If you do your own um, clauses and don't use this proxy fitting function, you still have to bind it to the to the uh, armatures, and the easiest way for that is use the weight transfer function. In the object operators, there is some uh, weight transfer, and what I use is just I do a weight transfer from the from the character that also uh, that that automatically has uh, the best weight on it through the lab and transfer that to the clause. And I use their, uh, what was it, uh, nearest, uh, nearest interpolated uh, faces. I think that, that works well. I mean, you have to, to try that through if you want to do that. But there's one function that works, works very well in weight transfer. So at the end, you have a character group uh, with, with clauses, with uh, uh, character mesh and yeah, ready to put into your scene. So it's, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. You start with the base character, you do some morphing to your character for the story. Uh, you have the base clauses, you do the morphing of the clauses. You put that together, and you have finalized rig character and later post-processing. And then you can do a lot of different variations out of that. Expressions, short word to expressions. The uh, Bastioni lab comes with shapes key, shape keys uh, for the face, a lot of shape keys. Uh, I don't know, something like 40 plus shape keys and you can use them to create a lot of different expressions. Very good. I got a book about that, of course, uh, to find out what good expressions look like. So what I do, I mean, the, the Bastioni lab has its own uh, tool for expressions using these shape keys, but that's not working with a linked character in the scene. So what I'm doing is, uh, I've built an armature with uh, some sliders for each of the shape key. Very primitive thing, yeah? Nothing fancy. And uh, yeah, shape keys are already provided by the lab. And then I have a small Python script that links or creates drivers for each shape key and, and, and links that driver to one of my uh, armature slider. Uh, so uh, when, when I have to do a lot of uh, characters, I just have to copy or append the rig, the face rig, and then run the script. And uh, five seconds later, I have the rig for the expressions for the shape keys. And yeah, then I had to sit down once to uh, create all these different expressions using the armatures, and then I put them in an expression library, a post library, 
And now I can reuse them quite easily. If I link the character, just uh, make a proxy uh, for the face rig and then go to the right expression from angry to whatever. And yeah, and the thing is working. And then of course you can do fine tuning with the sliders, but in, in, in many cases it works. Same with poses, I also would recommend to have a pose library because uh, I mean the, the uh, FK rig is not so easy to do, but if you have a good pose library, um, doesn't matter so much. You can also pose your hands separately. Um, so if you select some, some uh, bones, hand bones, right arm, hand bones, left arm or so, you can do a number of poses for the hands, like open or closed or fist or pointing and so on. And you can all, of course, uh, copy these or, or enable these poses then for left and right by, by the post library functions. So that also works out quite well. Okay. Last thing is grouping these stuff into a scene. Um, I have a number of clauses for each character. It's not just one clause, one character, one finished thing. So I want to have combinations. So what I do is I make a number of groups that collect, or it will be a collection in 2.8, so collection is fitting quite well here, that have the clause elements, shoes, body, and the masks. Um, you normally also have a mask behind the clause so that the body doesn't, doesn't show through. Um, and you can also then do uh, copies of the body mesh, just linked copies with different masks in the object layer, and then uh, create groups that have different masking for the clauses. Quite easy if you want to put in different stuff. So I skip that because probably seen that uh, landscapes I can also skip that it's it's mostly uh, mostly uh, a mesh with displacement modifier then I try to get a slope map out of that with a normal node and then I can use this slope map or slope function to have different different uh, materials for flat or for very steep terrain works quite well with ice. Clouds, yeah, um, not much time left. I thought I would have more time. But yeah. um, I, I do two types of claws, uh, clouds. One is uh, with uh, a complex, let me say, mesh that is filled with a volumetric shader. Um, works quite, because I needed some clouds in the story here. Looks nice, but has a big disadvantage if you get these too cloudy, too, uh, the, the surface is too complex, then you will have faces that don't arrange right, and then the volumetric shader creates holes. Um, you can do the, put in some smoothing function and remesh function in that, but uh, it only works for a certain, until a certain degree. If you want to have some really nice, you always have to fight against some, some holes in these uh, cloud structures. So what can you do? There's a second uh, way to do it. It's a little bit more, uh, need more power is start with some, some simple uh, cloud elements. Um, then normally I, I use a remesh modifier so that the faces are distributed evenly over the mesh. Then uh, distribute it, uh, uh, not uh, displace it by Voronoi function or whatever. Fill it with a particle system that has a smoothing effect and then run a smoke simulation on that, maybe just 10 10 cycles, gives you a very nice cloudy cloudy structure, it looks like that here. And best thing is if you do a, a panorama out of these clouds, 360 panorama, then you just can put it with the compositor into the scene. Um, so that gives us nice pictures. Okay, 
And then, of course, kit bashing interiors, nothing special. And only annoying thing is that uh, uh, Blender still uh, has a problem. If you have armatures on the door and you open the door, all the copies of the door are opening, for instance. Yeah, so you always have to do copies of the original object and link them into a scene. Uh, 2.8 should be better, but I think it still has these problems. They don't have uh, co uh, coded the functions. That this is overrides, amateur overrides. Okay, scene shots, not much time left. I mean, that's quite standard. What is important in the scene is linking all the assets. Uh, Finding some nine angels. What what is what I think is good is looking at lights here. Yeah, I normally use uh, ambient light. I use then some lights here, a yellow light from the left, a more bluish light from the right, so that you get some dramatic expressions. Yeah, and and you really have to learn a little bit about body language and how people act and behave, otherwise you get very flat and un uninteresting uh, situations. So I got a book about body language and, you know, <laughs> got a lot of books. Um, sometimes you have to use books, it's not everything on YouTube. <laughs> but you see, that's the same scene with different camera angels, angles um, and some body language and you really have to, to, to uh, learn that and, and try to do it. Um, then shots, if you have one scene environment and you want to do different shots, my recommendation is put them in a dope sheet, really, as you do with an animation. And that is not only the, the character, it's a camera, it's the lights, everything, put them into a dope sheet so that you can go back and forth between different shots and different scenes. Okay, good. Last thing, I think post-processing. Um, I was looking for some painterly uh, environment and I have found a project Dynamic Auto Painter for Media Chance that simulates a painting process. So you give it the photo or computer-generated picture and it puts out something that looks a little bit like, like Van Gogh or other painter styles and Personally, I like it much better. So if you have that scene, that's how it comes out of uh, Blender. It's nice, but uh, I, it looks <coughs> too much like, like photo or animation. That is how it comes then out of the uh, automatic painter. And that is a combination of both, so you can, can combine in the, in the post-processing program, you can combine both. And I think that looks quite nice. It is a mixture of this photorealistic stuff and the painterly stuff. Yeah, future would be artificial intelligence. Okay, one minute left. So, last thing I want to show is page layout. I was looking for a program for that. You can now do it in Photoshop with the latest version with frames. But you can do it quite well in, in Blender. And what you want is you want to have uh, normal frames, picture frames, but you also want overlapping, bigger, smaller ones, or you might also want to have uh, skewed things. And what you want also is um, to enlarge or move or change the picture inside the frame. That's very important because you can, I, I do everything 2000 by 2000, and so, I'm using Blender just with an orthographic camera and a number of different layers that simulate the page. Here are the image frames. Uh, the borders are just done by a, by a wireframe modifier. Here are the speech bubbles and the uh, thing. But for the picture frames, I use a special material. Um, each frame has its own material, and then you can use uh, some magic with the vectors to scale and move X, Y, that. 
the picture inside of the frame, the image frame. Very important if you want to do a layout independent from the contents to a certain and rearrange the images a little bit after you have done the layout or if you want to have a skewed layout or whatsoever. So very well done with Blender. Um, you can do it with a, with a expensive uh, desktop publishing program, but if you're looking for a solution to do page editing, that's the way to go. And that's my last word. Thank you for your attention. And the next one, please. Thank you.